Hello, and welcome to Sci-Fi's third webinar in the Introduction to Sci-Fi IP series. Today's webinar is titled Evaluating Sci-Fi RISC V Core IP. My name is Drew Barbier, and I'm a senior field applications engineer and your presenter today. This is the third part in a three-part webinar series. So previous webinar recordings are available as well as slides in the link above. In the first webinar, we talked about the fundamentals of RISC-V architecture. In the second webinar, we introduced Sci-Fi's E31 and E51 core complexes. And in today's webinar, we'll talk about getting started with Sci-Fi's RISC-V core IP evaluations. This presentation is targeted at embedded hardware and software designers who want to get started evaluating Sci-Fi's RISC-V core IP. This webinar will talk through the RTL evaluation of the E31 core complex, as well as programming, writing software, and debugging the E31 evaluation FPGA image with Freedom Studio. There will not be a live question portion to this webinar. Instead, we encourage all questions be sent to the uh, email address at the end of the presentation. So the first part in evaluating Sci-Fi's RISC-V core IP is actually obtaining the evaluations. So Sci-Fi offer two types of evaluations. Uh, the first being a Verilog RTL evaluation. This is fully functional, synthesizable Verilog RTL. This is really useful as it allows you to synthesize the design into your exact process and EDA flow, obtaining the most accurate power performance and area for your design. It also allows you to simulate, simulate the design in your exact environment. There are some restrictions on the evaluation RTL. The first being the, the, the Verilog is obfuscated. And we also reduce the sizes of the DTIM and system and peripheral port address space. We also offer an FPGA evaluation. This is a pre-built FPGA bitstream containing our core complexes and targeting a low cost FPGA platform. The FPGA's uh, evaluation is useful for software development. So obtaining the evaluations are very easy from our website. And in fact, they're just two clicks away. So from our homepage, you would click on the products and that'll take you to this page, to the products page where you scroll down to the yellow box for free evaluation. From here, there are links for both the FPGA Bitstream as well as the evaluation RTL. In order to obtain the evaluations, there is an evaluation license agreement. The agreements are signed uh, in a seamless DocuSign uh, process. So the first step in that is filling out your information in the web form on the Sci-Fi website. And then an evaluation agreement is sent to the email address you provided. Signing of the agreements is done completely in the DocuSign environment in the web browser. And once finished, uh, I do want to point out there is a yellow finish box at the bottom of the agreement that you click and the signed agreements are sent back to Sci-5. Sci if for any reason you run into problems with the evaluation license agreement, be it signing them or questions about um, specific clauses in the evaluation agreement, we encourage you to send emails to sales at sci5.com or order-support at sci5.com. Once the evaluation agreements are signed, the evaluation deliverables are then made available in your sci5 developer dashboard. In the web browser on the left, you can view the, you can see a snapshot of a dashboard where uh, this user has signed both the FPGA evaluation agreement and the RTL evaluation agreement. The exact deliverables can then be obtained by clicking uh, on, the, on the, the deliverable in the dashboard, and that takes you to the screen on the right, where you can actually download the bundles, as well as view things like the release notes and documentation as well. So I do want to call attention to the documentation on the top right of the screen. So from this, uh, from this page, you can download the core complex manuals, which is the same thing you could download from the documents page of the Sci-5 website. But there is also an RTL and FPGA evaluation user guide, depending on the deliverable. These are only available from this page, and I encourage everybody who uh, downloads the evaluation 
to download these user guides as well. A lot of the information covered in this webinar is also covered in the user guides. <coughs> I also want to call attention to the evaluation product refresh that's currently going on inside Sci5. So we are in the process of updating the evaluation deliverables as of this month, and they should hit the website soon. Now, we're not going to go into details in this webinar of the, the E31 or E51 core complexes. If you do have specific questions regarding uh, features of the different core complexes, I would encourage you to go back and look at the second webinar. Um, second webinar's video or product slides. So some of the changes in the uh, refreshed evaluations. So we've updated the, the course with the latest features. So in the RTL, we have the instruction tightly integrated memory. We've also increased the number of hardware breakpoints to four. We have performance counters in the course now as well. Uh, we've also changed the port interfaces so the evaluation versions now come with uh, on the E31 an AHB light interface and on the E51 an AXI interface. Originally on the evaluation versions, these were tile link ports, um, but in the full um, product deliverable, you can configure these to whichever you like, and that is still the case. Also, we changed the number of global interrupts due to customer feedback. So on the E31, we reduced these to uh, 127. And on the E51, we've changed this to 255. We've also made some changes to the FPGA evaluation. Uh, as we mentioned, this um, FPGA eval is most useful for software development. So reflecting that, we've increased the size of the DTIM from 16 kilobytes to 64. And we've also increased the number of hardware breakpoints from two to eight. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at the E31 RTL evaluation. Starting off with the actual RTL bundle. So once you untar the bundle, there are a number of folders and files, and we'll step through those quickly here. So in the info folder, this contains metadata about the design. So things like the memory dimensions, which we'll talk about in a few slides, as well as a DTS file uh, outlining the exact configuration of the E31 uh, core itself. There's a test folder which contains uh, simple tests which are run on top of the test bench. It also includes uh, device header files for peripherals and design such as the Plick and Clint. In the Verilog folder of the design, this is where the actual RTL deliverable lives. So in the Verilog design folder, we have the device under test or the actual E31 in this particular case or the E51. In the Verilog memories folder, we have behavioral models of the SRAMs, which are used for running the, the test benches. And then there's the test bench folder, which contains the actual test bench of the design. Finally, there's the make file, and the make file uh, runs the VCS simulation, which executes the tests on top of the test bench. On our E-series core complex, we have uh, three clock inputs into the design. The first being core clock zero. Core clock zero is the main CPU and level one memory clock. Typically when we quote frequencies on our website, this is the clock input that we're referring to. There's a secondary peripheral clock simply called clock. The relationship between clock and core clock zero is that clock must be an integer multiple of core clock zero with a one to one ratio is acceptable. So clock can be one to one with core clock zero or one to two or one to three and so on. RTC toggle is the real time clock input uh, of the uh, core complex as defined by the RISC-V architecture. So this is the input into the M time uh, control and status register. The, the relationship between this clock and the others is that it must run at strictly less than half the rate of clock. So the overall relationship between the clocks are as follows. Core clock zero must be greater than or equal to clock, which must be greater than two times RTC toggle. So we also describe the clocking in the user guide and also in the user guide, we provide an example synthesis constraints file, which you can see on the right. Uh, we also provide some guidance on clocking recommendations. 
uh, depending on your exact implementation. So if you're interested in maximum frequency, then our recommendation is to set clock equal to half the frequency of core clock zero to where the, uh, the ports and the peripherals are running at half the frequency of the core. However, if you are targeting lower frequencies, it is perfectly acceptable to have clock and core clock zero equal. Also there, we, I have some guidance here for RTC toggle frequencies. Um, so the, the signal name has RTC or real-time clock in it. So it's, it's quite common to have this frequency, uh, this clock set to 32.7 kilohertz uh, clock. However, it's perfectly fine to have this set to one megahertz or some other frequency if, if, you, if desired. The core complex memory instances, so as part of the deliverable, we include behavioral models of the RAMs, and these are provided in the Verilog memories uh, folder of the deliverable, which we talked about earlier. In the user guide and, and in the information folder, we also describe the dimensions of the actual SRAMs that need to be implemented. So when you're synthesizing the design and your flow, it's necessary to generate these memory instances. So Sci-5 does not deliver uh, specific memory instances for the, the cores, as typically these are specific to your foundry and process. So one would usually obtain these memory instances from your foundry or from a third-party IP provider. And finally, we'll give some guidance on the E31 and this is relevant to the E51 as well, the synthesized area hierarchy so that it's uh, give a better uh, understanding of what you're looking at when you're looking at some of your synthesized area results. So starting at the most basic level, so the system E31 core gives you the logic only uh, area information for the core pipeline. And I've highlighted that here with the red box. If you look at the system E31 hierarchy, this gives you the core plus the level one memory instances. And finally, if you just look at the system hierarchy, this gives you the top level area information, and this would include everything in the core complex uh, or the gray box in the diagram. Hopefully this information is useful when uh, performing comparisons against other cores, for example. Okay, now let's take a look at the E31 FPGA evaluation. So the E31 and E51 FPGA evaluations target a popular low-cost FPGA development board created by Digilent. It's called the Digilent RD board. The RD board contains a Xilinx Artix 35T FPGA, which has 30, over 33,000 Xilinx logic cells. And this is plenty enough to contain an E31 in the configuration we have, as well as the 64-bit E51. The RD board also contains other peripherals that we make use of. So it has a 16 megabyte QSPY serial flash. It also has a USB UART, buttons, switches, and LEDs. Our FPGA evaluations uh, operate at 65 megahertz. Uh, this is quite a bit faster than you could do on RTL simulation, making the FPGA platforms extremely useful for software uh, evaluation. And be that uh, testing algorithms uh, that you're writing or integrating operating systems or third-party software to your design. Sci-5 do not sell these boards directly. Instead, they can be purchased directly from Digilent in the URL provided here. So the FPGA evaluation configuration, so these take the same E31 core complex deliverable that you receive in the, the RTL evaluation, and we integrate this with some sci-fi peripherals, which then connect to physical devices on the RD board. So we have a QSPY peripheral, which connects to the uh, serial <laughs> flash on the RD board. We have a GPIO controller, which then interfaces to various LEDs and buttons and IOs on the RD board. And then we have a pulse width modulator, which also connects to some of the LEDs on the board, as well as a debug interface. There are also connections from uh, these physical devices back into the global and local interrupts as well for testing out interrupt schemes. 
Uh, we touched on this earlier, but the core complex features. Um, so it's the E31 core, which supports user uh, machine and user modes. Also has eight hardware breakpoints and eight region physical memory protection, ITEM, vectored interrupts, performance counters, and basically everything else offered on E31 core. Since the FPGA evaluation is an entire system, uh, the FPGA user guide includes information uh, such as the, the memory map, so the expanded memory map to cover the, the peripherals included with the design. It also includes the interrupts and, and connections from physical devices to specific interrupt numbers and, and pins on the board. This is all provided in the user guide, which is available from the same developer, developer dashboard site where you would download the actual FPGA evaluation. So from the developer dashboard, you would download an MCS file, which can then be programmed into the RD board using the Xilinx uh, Vivado tool. So to do this, you would download uh, Vivado from the Xilinx website, specifically the HLX edition, which is free. And I provided a URL for that. Upon opening Vivado, you would select Open Hardware Manager, which I've highlighted here in red. Then select Tools, Auto Connect. And Tools, Add Configuration Memory Device. And then you would select the Micron N25Q128 3.3 volt device. Uh, shortcut for this, shortcut for this is to select uh, Micron from the manufacturer here. Uh, select 128 from the density, and then this memory device will be the last one on the page here. Once you select the memory device, it'll ask you for the configuration file. This is the MCS file that you downloaded from Sci5. Once you provide that file and hit OK, Avado will then program the RD board with the image. After programming is complete, hit the prog button on the RD board which reboots the RD board and loads in the programmed image. So now that you have the E31 core complex programmed into the FPGA, the next step is connecting that FPGA to the debugger, and this would be done over a JTAG connection. So again, the details of doing this are described in the user guide, but I have a, a handy uh, color-coded map here as well, uh, mapping the different JTAG signals uh, from the RD PMOD D connector, uh, I'm sorry, the RD JD PMOD connector to the uh, common ARM 20 pin header interface. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the signals here on the webinar, but we've tested um, different JTAG probe interfaces uh, with this design. And so the tested probes are the Alamex, uh, which works with Open OCD, Segur J Link devices also work, as well as Lauterbach Trace 32. So now that you have a physical connection to the board over JTAG, you can then do software development on the RD board using Freedom Studio. So Freedom Studio uh, bundles together a lot of open source technology. So one being Eclipse. So we bundle Eclipse along with C developer tools and the GNU MCU Eclipse plugins. We also bundle pre-built binaries of the GCC tool chain and OpenOCD as well as examples for Sci-5 platforms. Freedom Studio is free from our website. You can download it from sci-fi.com slash products slash tools. Um, the setup is, is very simple, and I do want to say we're in the process of releasing an updated version of Freedom Studio as well to coincide with our updated evaluation versions of our IP. Uh, this version should be available uh, soon, similar to the, the refreshed evaluations. Um, so once you download a, a Freedom Studio, you would then extract it to your desired location. And that's really all that you have to do. Toolchain paths on the new version are all set up for you, so there's no new dialog that pops up. If you're on Windows, there is one extra step in that you have to install driver platforms for the, the RD and Hi5 one boards. And these drivers are made available in the Freedom Studio Sci-5 Drivers folder. And that's it. Okay, so next we're gonna go through a Freedom Studio demo of actually importing examples 
Um, we're going to walk through the new uh, Freedom Studio sci-fi perspective, and then we're going to actually program uh, a demo into the board and debug that demo. Okay, so here I have my Freedom Studio environment. I have uh, lots of views available here, so we'll walk through some of them. The first being the Project Explorer. This is where I would interact with different source code in my application. I also have a register view, which we'll talk about when we start debugging, as well as peripherals. <clears throat> I have an outline view where I can step through different um, functions and defines in my code for the, the current active file. So to import an example, so I have one imported here already, but I'll walk through the process. So I right click in Project Explorer and click Import. Under General, I would select Existing Projects into Workspace, select Archive File, and then in the Freedom Studio deliverable, there's a sci-fi folder with examples in it, and here we have a zip file containing um, example projects for various sci-fi platforms. So if I click on E31, it gives me a list of all the examples uh, available in that zip file, and I can simply check the ones that I want and import the desired project. In this case, I already have Drystone imported. So I can select the project and click Build. And we'll go through the build process and build the example. And after build, it gives me a nice printout of uh, the code size for, for different sections in the program. To get started debugging, I would click on Debug Configurations, and then under Open OCD, I have uh, the Drystone example already in there. I click Debug. And the debugger connects, and I'm now at my main function. Um, I can view things like disassembly on my code. I also have a terminal connection here, uh, so I can configure Freedom Studio to connect to the USB serial port on the board, and that's what you see here. It's already printed out uh, one of the statements in the program, which uh, tells you the frequency at which the RD board is running, which is 65 megahertz. So interacting with the debugger, I can see the different threads here in my application. I can also see various breakpoints that I set. So in this case, what I'm going to do is on the scanf function, I have a breakpoint set on this line where I set the number of iterations that Drystone will run. So if I click run, I now get a green line here indicating that my program ran to this line and halted. And I can go back to the debugger view and get a uh, graphical view of the call stack. So I see scanf was called from main, and if I click on main, I see the exact line that called this function. Other debug views that are, that are useful is the expression view. So I can put in various CSRs into this view and get a readout. I can also view different variables in the program from this window. If I open the register view, it gives me a view of all the architectural registers. Um, and then, so this is a new feature is the peripherals view. And this gives me a nice, graphical representation of peripherals in my design. So in this case, for example, if I click GPIO, I get a printout of the GPIO registers, and I can expand these registers and look at various different bit fields and set and clear them um, from the GUI itself without actually executing code. It's a very handy feature, especially when learning uh, new peripherals. Okay, so for the purpose of this uh, demo, what I'm going to do is step through a few lines of disassembly. <clears throat> so in this particular line, you can see it sets A5 equal to this number here. For the purpose of this demonstration, uh, I'm gonna change this from the GUI as such. And if I step again over this store instruction, it writes that value back to memory. So now instead of executing for this large number of iterations, I'm now gonna execute at a much smaller number. So now if I hit run, 
We go back to the terminal view. My program is running. I can see on the printout that it's a much smaller number here, and I get a dry stone per second readout uh, in the terminal window. Okay, so that concludes the demo. So in the demo, we showed how to import an example. We also walked through the Freedom Studio Sci-Fi perspective, and we also walked through programming and debugging an example application. As I mentioned, there won't be a live question and answer portion to this webinar. If you do have questions, though, we encourage you to send an email to info at sci-fi.com, and we'll respond to your email as fast as possible. So this concludes the third webinar in a three-part webinar series. We have all the webinar recordings and slides available in the URL provided on this slide. So again, in part one, we covered uh, an overview of the RISC-V architecture. In part two, we went through the details of Sci-Fi's RISC-V core IP, specifically the E31 and E51 core complexes. And in this webinar, we discussed uh, downloading, and walking through the evaluations for both the RTL evaluation as well as the FPGA evaluation. I'd like to leave you with the resource slide uh, with links to useful resources, both from Sci-5 as well as RISC-5. Uh, the new one on this slide being the Sci-5 YouTube channel. So we'll also be posting these uh, webinar recordings to our, our YouTube channel. I encourage you to subscribe to uh, the Sci-5 channel. Thank you for attending. Have a great day.